It took Superintendent Latrobe something like five months to actually reach the Port Phillip area. So they travelled by sea, and that's he and his young Swiss wife, Sophie. After that, they actually had to be rowed up the Yarra River, and then they had to wade ashore. That's how they arrived. And of course, they took their prefabricated home to Jollymont and set it up there. Charles Latrobe came to Victoria in 1839 and he came as the superintendent of the Port Phillip district because Victoria wasn't its own self-governed colony at the time. It was a satellite of New South Wales. He arrived to a hotbed of issues as a young man who had no military background and no government background. But they needed somebody to oversee the sheep farms and the land that was down here in the Port Phillip district. There was no parliament, so Charles Latrobe was doing everything. There was very little public infrastructure. There were no roads, there were very few buildings, there were very few institutions. There were only about 10,000 non-Indigenous inhabitants at that stage. In 1851, gold was discovered. By 1852, there was an explosion of the number of people arriving here by ship. They were coming from all parts of the world and La Trobe had to oversee this incredible population explosion. You can imagine the infrastructure that was suddenly needed when this colony was just swelling in numbers at a rate that was inconceivable. If you look at the spine of our city and go through some of our major institutions, you'll see that they have their, their genesis or their birth in La Trobe's time. So if you start with the University of Melbourne, ranked as Australia's number one university, that started back in La Trobe's time. And then you think of the Royal Botanic Gardens and most of the beautiful gardens that surround our city were all envisaged by La Trobe. Melbourne is now a UNESCO city of literature. Well, that library was founded in La Trobe's era as well. You see that it wasn't until 1974 that Sir Henry Winnicky was the first Australian citizen who was appointed as governor. Before that, all of the governors were from the British aristocracy. We often talk about the governors, and we don't as often talk about the governors' wives. They have been great unsung heroes. They were women who were prepared to roll up their sleeves and get on with it, whether it was for the Red Cross or Children's Protection Society. It was also expected that she would often entertain the uh, guests after dinner by singing, something I haven't asked my husband to do. <laughs> it took the British government a year to find a replacement for La Trobe, and that man was Charles Hotham. When Sir Charles Hotham and Lady Jane Hotham arrived in Victoria in June of 1854, they came here to Turak House. Shortly after their arrival in Victoria, the position of Lieutenant Governor was changed to Governor of Victoria. So Lady Jane became the first official Governor's wife and she set a really high example because she was so much loved by the people of Victoria. She really enjoyed her role. Although Lady Jane had been brought up in privilege and as part of the British aristocracy, she had no airs and graces, and the people of Victoria really liked that. They arrived to discover a colony in an absolute mess. Unlike the governors of today, governors in Hotham's time actually had an enormous amount of power over people's daily lives. He was very inflexible, and this is where Hotham's naval training got in the way of, I'd say, his common sense. He's seen as the governor who oversaw the massacre at Eureka, that saw more than 22 miners and four military men killed. And this was a sign that Hotham's popularity had reached rock bottom. 
I guess the funny thing about Lady Hotham is that she would have made a much better governor than her husband. But in 1854, it would have been inconceivable to imagine that today we would have an Australian woman as our head of state. It's wonderful to showcase Victorian talent right here in this Government House ballroom. Circus Oz, of course, was born in Victoria, so to have them performing here was an absolute treat. The Governor asked Circus Oz if we had anything that we could bring to activate the ballroom and to um, get some kids into the house. Oh, I suppose the inner child in all of us loves circus, but it's more what Circus Oz is able to do because they do so much work with children and with children who might not always have opportunities and that's something that's very dear to me. It is a bit like a basketball hall. I mean, really, basketball stadium. It's just a lot fancier. There's a lot of gold in that roof. So today was really fun. We did a workshop with uh, about 40 kids from the Collingwood English Language School. We taught them a balance that they then performed in the show in front of the governor. And then they had afternoon tea with the governor. It was really great. The governor house is like a castle. It's very big. If we can say to little ones, particularly these newly arrived ones, you're welcome. This is the home of the head of state or representing the head of state. I don't know if they fully understand that concept yet, but they will understand the sense of welcome and of being somewhere very special to Victoria. La Trobe came to Victoria in 1839 with Sophie and their two daughters and their prefabricated house. But Charles was really a visionary and he knew that eventually a larger government house would be needed. And so in 1841, he set aside a huge allotment of land along the Yarra River. It would take over 30 years for government house to eventually be built on this spot and they would come up with this incredibly stunning building. I think it was really Charles Latrobe's vision that set the stage for what later was going to happen. It ended up being designed by the chief architect of the Victorian Public Works. Government House is the biggest house in Australia still. And it's really beautifully proportioned. There's wings which all meet at a very beautifully proportioned tower. The building's considered aesthetically beautiful, it's considered architecturally important, and then obviously it has great historical merit for what it is, what it does. When the ballroom was measured, it was found to be a little bit bigger than the one at Buckingham Palace. And there is this myth that there was a message that came from Queen Victoria to just cut it down a little bit so it actually didn't compete. And the story goes that the message didn't get here in time <laughs> and that the ballroom was built the way it was intended from day one. We were building a bit of a palace. <laughs> It's seen some magnificent events. When the house was opened in 1876, a ball was held for 1,400 people. So we read of these magnificent balls with the latest Paris fashion being paraded by the women and, for example, gold dust sprinkled in their hair. And it has seen a lot of balls over the years, but its modern use is really quite different. I'm the patron of Red Cross and the Red Cross performed very important service here, packing boxes and equipment and stores for the fighting men and women in the First War. And it was my delight to host um, a blood donor day here in the ballroom last year. We had 100 people turned up to donate blood and they had the pleasure, if that's the right word, of giving their blood whilst looking at this magnificent uh, ceiling. So there's been a beautiful music program uh, run at Government House here for some time. 
but it was usually chamber music. One of the uh, joys for me has been being able to expand that well-established program so that we've had a diverse range of art forms and performance on show. We've had a rock concert for young teenagers to get them interested in the work of the governor and so that they understand the work that we do. And again, so that they know that this big, big building in the centre of Melbourne is somewhere welcoming for them. We've also had um, a wonderful function here to celebrate Ida Hobbit Day, as we call it, and that was very special. There were uh, about a thousand people that came into the house. Many were emotional. Um, it was, as they said, the first time that their community had been officially invited into a government house anywhere in Australia and we were delighted that we could um, do that. You're welcome tonight and marking International Day Against Homophobia, Biphobia, Intersex and Transphobia is a strong and indeed very meaningful stance and a strong statement of unconditional acceptance, support and celebration in our community. It's always an honour to be the Commissioner for Gender and Sexuality, but never more so than tonight. And on behalf of the LGBTIQ plus people here, can I warmly thank you and acknowledge your welcome to Government House. I think these are good examples of the openness and inclusiveness which we want the House to stand for. So I talk a lot about diversity. It's very dear to me. It's as dear to me in the art that we choose in this house as it is in everything that we do. The National Gallery of Victoria has always lent major artworks to Government House. It's been something that's been in our charter really for over a century. So you'll find that our works, uh, many of them have happily lived here almost their entire lives. Well, in choosing the art here, it's been important to me to show our wonderful creative state and the talent, because that's actually a very important part of our economy in Victoria. And if we can't showcase that well in this house, where can we showcase it well? So we rotate works constantly at Government House. In fact, we've never been more active in the way that we rotate work because we like to keep it fresh and dynamic. And we also want to give a lot of opportunities to artists. So in addition to the beautiful Streetons and McCubbins and magnificent older works, we now have very contemporary works, including uh, quite gritty works on show because we're showing Victorian art through the ages. We've had an overwhelmingly positive response to the range of artworks that we've been showing in this room and in a range of other rooms. And that's heartening for us, but also of course for the artist. I want young artists, I want indigenous artists. I want our art, like everything else in this house, to represent Victoria thoroughly. A great piece of architecture takes all of the things it needs to do, makes it work beautifully on the inside and then actually gives it an equally important physical presence in the place where it sits. It's probably now one of Melbourne's best loved buildings. Just as the governors have changed, so has the program. So the one that's particularly close to my heart is a program that we run for women from migrant or refugee backgrounds. I got a call from Government House a little while after she became governor and she'd said, listen, we've got this garden, trying to work out how we access the right community. And so she invited me to Government House to come and have a look at the space allotted for the garden. And it was so beautiful. It was so beautiful. And I could picture our hub women here. This is the Peace and Prosperity Garden Program. We do planting and with the existing um, growing vegetables and everything in the garden, we pick and then we cook. They come in in groups and meet each other, spend time with each other, spend time with us, uh, learn about uh, the house but learn about the role. Some of them are refugees, uh, some of them have come on family reunion visas, some of them have come to work here. The thing that connects them is, is often a need to connect. I've got parents here that's been here for over 20 years but could hardly speak English because they stay at home, they got nowhere to go, they got no connections, they got no friends and this is the best way they feel confident and, and see Australia in, in a brighter, nicer way. 
she pops in every now and then. Oh, you've got the coffee. Oh. <laughs> Which is great, gets the women so excited. She came and she introduced herself and she asked everybody names and where are we from, what is our culture, background, what is our favourite food. Many come from countries where the head of state would not have welcomed them into their home in that way, so it's quite symbolic. I'm very happy to be here. But at the same time, we're doing events to encourage young girls to study science, technology, engineering and mathematics. That's something we know is important for the future of our state. We know that to achieve the best, we need all our talent, not just the brilliant boys and men, we need the brilliant girls and women as well. Science Gallery Melbourne is a really important cause because it is all about inspiring young people to do STEM and to get involved with um, this collision of art and science. Thank you. By having the governor there, we were able to bring in so many other people that we wouldn't have access to otherwise. And that's really important when you're building support for a cause. We wouldn't have been able to do it without Government House. It was in Government House that we did this. It's such a traditional kind of environment and it's something that people like me normally don't ever see. We have open day on Australia Day every year when anyone can come into the property and in 2016 we had 21,000 people of which 8,500 came inside the house so that was a pretty big day but quite a special day as well. We're very keen to have as many come into the house as possible. So today we have 60 school children. They're going to camp out here at Government House on the lawn tonight. And this is a program that we're running with Vic Health and the YMCA. These two schools were chosen because they're from different parts of Victoria. So one is from the east and one is from the west. We are one out of two schools to be chosen to camp out in the Governor's House. Thank you so much for hosting us here. So that means we're like very, very lucky and I'm so excited, um, my heart's going to blow up. And they both are schools that have a high level of diversity, they're from low socioeconomic backgrounds. They don't often get the chance to do something like this. And I've never actually been camping outdoors like that. Because you are going to learn so much about things that just help make you healthier and happier. Going back, there was more pomp and ceremony around the governor and uh, getting to meet a, a, a dignitary, the head of state of Victoria, but to actually get to meet her and um, for her to be so welcoming and accommodating, I think is going to have a lasting and long-term effect for our children. It's important to me that Victorians know it is their state house, so that children from some of our less advantaged schools can learn about their government house, their state house. So we have a Westminster system of government and the role of the governor is very, very important. It's a fundamental role that protects our state constitution. So when it comes to the parliament, the parliament's made up of the crown and the upper house and the lower house. And the crown or the monarch is represented here in Victoria by the governor. It's important to note that for about the last 30 years or so, it's been enshrined in legislation that the monarch doesn't in any way direct the governor in what the governor does. So it's an independent role, but representing the Queen as Australia's head of state and the head of state of Victoria. Traditionally, the governor's role's been explained as having three main parts to it, constitutional, ceremonial, and community. But in reality, Nowadays, it really has a fourth major part, which is international engagement. As a new ambassador, I'm very encouraged to see that the relationship between Indonesia and Australia, including with uh, Victoria, 
have been growing from strength to strength. It's a global environment and for Victoria's economic, social and cultural prosperity, we need to be engaging internationally. Governor Linda Dassault and Mr Anthony Howard have extended a very warm welcome to me and they also invited me to stay overnight in Government House. I really felt very honoured and they also hosted a very wonderful dinner and they invited also so many VIPs and relevant stakeholders from Victoria, uh, providing me an opportunity to establish networking, something that is very important in the discharge of my mission. The Governor is highly regarded by Chinese dignitaries and also Chinese uh, business people. She goes to China, represent the people, represent the state, and she, more importantly, she is apolitical. She doesn't represent one particular party. The fact that the governor is apolitical overarches all of that work. The international engagement would be quite different if it was being done by a political person who will transact uh, policy and agreements and economic strategy. So an interesting fact that a lot of people don't realise is the Governor doesn't vote in state elections, cannot vote in state elections, and that's for the very sensible reason that to be totally outside politics means even giving up that fundamental right to vote. It's quite interesting because there are many aspects of this role that have changed over the years. There are many that have stayed the same. So what stayed the same, I think, is Governor's commitments to the community. This magnificent house is located in the centre of Melbourne, but we spend a great deal of time outside this house, all around regional Victoria. And that is very, very important. In the old days, uh, Lieutenant Governor Latrobe did it on horseback. And now, of course, we drive and we're able to cover a lot of territory. It is lovely to see so much young talent on stage and you're another wonderful example of collaboration and connectivity in this community. It's just wonderful to, to move around our state, which is something that I do all the time as the governor for the whole of Victoria. Today I've been able to see some of our manufacturing that's pretty important because it's various items to do with our defence forces. Good afternoon. And then for a complete change of pace, I've been meeting with some of our best and brightest young entrepreneurs and innovators talking about their industries of the future. So that's why we're here and we'd love to hear from each one of you and then perhaps ask you a few questions. It's really important to remember Victoria's state motto, peace and prosperity. And if you look at this house, you can see the reflection of the prosperity of the 19th century when we had the gold rush. But I like to think of prosperity also going very much hand in hand with peace in the sense that I think prosperity can also entail what every single person wants for themselves and their families and that's just a good life and a safe life and a life with equal opportunity and fairness. There is a huge variety in this work. One of the loveliest parts of it is the opportunity to thank and congratulate Victorians for their achievements. It might be for their bravery in a crisis. We see that all the time. And what a privilege it is to be the one that gives the medal and says on behalf of all Victorians, thank you for what you do. We've been delighted to host a special lunch that we had for volunteers to work throughout the community on Christmas Day and who would never get a chance to sit down and have a Christmas lunch themselves. My name's Kevin Sullivan, a volunteer at Osnham House. This is a uh, drug and alcohol facility. I sat with uh, the Governor's husband, uh, Tony. It was fantastic, uh, fantastic experience. I'll never forget it. Because I know so many of you will look after other people on Christmas Day. 
So let us look after you today, and we're so thrilled to have you here. Thank you. So this morning we've had a, a group of Indigenous kids come in, about 30, and uh, that was very special. Governor Linda Desso is going to meet you later this morning when we finish the little tour. We're going to go out and have kick to kick on the Western lawn out here. So she'll take a few speckies with you, perhaps. Uh, my school invited, like, showed me the opportunity, so I was like, yeah, why not? Because usually we go to Parliament House. So these four works that you see on the wall are by an Indigenous painter called Brooke Andrew. These four works are photographs that he got out of archives of people in the 1890s. And he's covered them with this gelatin print and then scraped it all off. I think it reflects the struggle and disadvantage of Aboriginal communities. I think they're very moving and um, lots of people who come in here are very moved by them. Many people, particularly young people, don't know what the governor's role is and uh, it's very important, I think, that we can open ourselves up to the community as much as possible. Parliament is, as you know, the political parties, the government of the day. They have debates and they pass laws. The law is just called a bill, it's not actually become a law until it comes to the governor. In constitutional terms, the Governor provides a last set of eyes. So for example, no Bill of Parliament actually becomes operational as a law until the Governor has cast his or her eyes over it and given what's called royal assent. There is someone independent outside the decision-making process who can just look at things one last time to ensure that the Constitution is properly applied. She also signs into existence appointments of judges and other people that the government has appointed. And I actually didn't want to come at the start, so I hesitated to show up, but stuck to it and my mind was just blown. And yeah, wasn't really expecting it to be this good, but yeah, it's been awesome. It's very much a program that's designed to treat the house as a community asset, which it is. <laughs> you do see an overlap between the ceremonial uh, part of the role and the community part of the role, and a really good example is Australia Day. On that occasion, it's the governor that leads the flag raising at our town hall so that it is absolutely clear that it's an apolitical occasion. It's an occasion for all Victorians. To make sure that we are always welcoming to those who join us here, no matter where they come from. But it's an important community occasion too because it gives the governor the opportunity to make statements about unity and harmony uh, in front of a, a broad range of Victorians. My husband Tony joins me wishing each and every Victorian all the very best on this Australian Day.